it's good to see all of you. Glad you're back. Thank you. I am too. Driving down, I wasn't so sure. But uh, as we were driving down and we hit uh, snow and ice in Charlotte and Columbia and, and uh, thunderstorm in Florida, I was thinking in my mind, I did not say this out loud because I knew I would get a lecture and I was locked in a car with my wife and I didn't want a lecture. But I was thinking to myself, this is dumb. Uh, but, thank the Lord, he saw us through and protected us. We saw lots of vehicles, lots of cars in the median alongside the road that had lost and were stuck. And, uh, you know, the Good Samaritan in me wanted to get out and push every one of them out. But I was afraid if I stopped, I'd get stuck too. And uh, once they got out, who knows whether they would have stayed and helped me get out. Um, so anyway, I just got behind a snow truck and kept going. But uh, thank the Lord. Uh, coming home was gorgeous. Beautiful. Sorry Bonnie and Dick had a rough time getting home, but uh, we had a beautiful time. And a great time. A relaxing time. As much as you can relax with a grandchild. Um, but we had a, a terrific time. But it is good to be home. It's good to be home. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Exodus. And I will pre-warn you. The message is kind of lengthy today. Alright? Remember I was locked in a condominium all week with Bonnie. So the message is kind of lengthy today. <laughs> I had lots of material to work with. Um, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I promised Bonnie on vacation I wouldn't pick on her so much, so I'm going to try not to. I'm going to try to keep that promise. Exodus chapter 14. We're going to start at verse 21. And I'm reading from a different translation, Jerry. I'm reading from God's Word translation. Um, I love it. it it's on... It's on my computer, and so I love this translation. I haven't found it in a bookstore yet. And I'm still looking for it. Hopefully I can find it um, because it, it is terrific. The wording of it is, is really good. Um, and so follow along. You ought to be able to follow along a little bit. And uh, if you can, just listen. And picture this story in your imagination. Okay? Um, I'd ask that you stand one more time in honor of reading the word this morning. <clears throat> we'll start at verse 21, Exodus 14. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. All that night the Lord pushed back the sea with a strong east wind and turned the sea into dry ground. The water divided. And the Israelites went through the middle of the sea on dry ground. The water stood like a wall on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them. And all Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and cavalry followed them into the sea. Just before dawn, the Lord looked down from the column of fire and smoke and threw the Egyptian camp into a panic. He made the wheels of their chariots come off so they could hardly move. Chariots got flat tires. <laughs> then the Egyptians shouted, Let's get out of here! The Lord is fighting for Israel. He's against us. You ever had God fight for you? If you've ever had God fight for you, you will never have to fight for yourself again. Amen. Think about it. Verse 26, then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the water will flow back over the Egyptians, their chariots, and their cavalry. Moses stretched his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the water returned to its usual place. The Egyptians tried to escape, 
But the Lord swept them into the sea. Somebody's enemies going down. The water flowed back and covered Pharaoh's entire army, as well as the chariots and the cavalry that had followed Israel into the sea. Not one of them survived. Meanwhile, the Israelites had gone through the sea on dry ground, while the water stood like a wall on their right and on their left. <laughs> that day, the Lord saved Israel from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the seashore. When the Israelites saw the great power of the Lord, the great power the Lord had used against the Egyptians, they feared the Lord and believed in him and in his servant, Moses. <coughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. I thank you for this body of believers that have come together to worship you and to study and to dig into your word. And I pray, Lord, that if there is one here that does not know you as Savior, they will not leave this place without opening their heart and accepting Christ as their Savior. Speak to us. Have your will in your way. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I want to talk a little bit about this passage. Just a little bit. About an hour or so. The subject today is dangerous deliverance. Almost an oxymoron of theological thought. Dangerous deliverance. Deliverance makes me want to shout. Right? Amen. But danger makes me uncomfortable. Have you ever had mixed emotions? It was a good time and a bad time. We were having a good time in Florida. And I heard about Shelly passing away. Heard about Ian going in the hospital. <coughs> heard about Jean's mother-in-law passing away. It was a good time and a bad time all at the same time. You had something to shout about, but you really couldn't shout because it was a good time and yet it was a bad time. Dangerous deliverance. If I were to give this a subtopic or a subtitle, I would call it, it would be just one simple word, escape. This past week, I, you know, I love nature, and I love looking at the animals and looking at nature. I'm not like my wife. I really don't care what they're called. I just love looking at them. <laughs> my wife sees a bird. She doesn't know what it looks like. She Googles it and finds it and online. She found out many different kinds of birds that were flying around this week, and I couldn't tell you any of them. They just look beautiful. But I love looking at animals of nature. I love the opportunity as I'm looking at nature and looking at those animals. I love the opportunity to see God in nature and His creation and how He reveals Himself through nature. Because according to Romans 1.20, before we had Bibles, God expected us to detect Him through nature. Through the created things. That he created. He wanted us to see his signature. His handiwork. And to detect some aspects of his thought and personality. We had that opportunity this past week. We went to uh, the Rainforest Cafe. Zoe was scared to death. Uh, but we went anyway. Calmed her down. While waiting there for our dinner, we were looking at the aquariums. And if you've ever been to the Rainforest Cafe, there were a lot of aquariums all over the place. Okay? We're looking at the aquariums and, and all the different kinds of fish. All different sizes, all different colors, all different shapes, all different things. 
things. And, and Richard even said to me uh, at dinner time, he said, you know, God has a sense of humor. <laughs> Doesn't that fish look funny? And it did. It looked funny. You know, it, it's just neat to see the different things and the different aspects of God in nature. <laughs> different things. So as I look in the different animals, look out at the zoo, out in nature, I see lions in their majesty. I look at rhinos that look like a tank an army could use, elephant that walks down into a lake and throws water over its head with its trunk. It just boggles my mind. It's neat to see the different films, the nature films that Disney's put out and, and different ones have put out. We've got several that, um, that are put out by a Christian company. I can't remember the name of it right offhand, but it's neat to see the different stories of the different animals, the salmon that go back to where they were born just by a sense of smell and smelling the water. Um, to see them in, to see them there in the zoo, there uh, there are always individuals though in the film who are knowledgeable in two different kinds of ways, two different types of types of people. One is intellectual, <laughs> knows a lot of the information about the animal. The other is instinct, knows what the animal might do, and sometimes the intellect doesn't have the instinct. Okay, and so they rely on each other. We're that way in the church, aren't we? Amen. Some of us have instinct. Some of us have intellect. Okay? I'm not very intellectual, so I must have the instinct. Although some would say I don't have the instinct either. We have to, we have to rely on each other. One is able to bring insight into the behavior of the animals because of the intellect. But the other one is who has the instinct, has lived with the animals, has been through those situations, and can sense danger, movement, and activity. And if you watch some of the nature shows, you will see the intellectual rely on the one with instinct to know which way the animal went. Because there are some things that are only perceived through your ability to have instinct. Intellectualism may not always reveal everything that you need to know. And some of the films that I've watched and the nature talks that I've listened to, that when I was growing up I thought were really boring, but my father made us listen to them anyway. Now I find them very interesting and I make my kids listen to them and they think they're boring too. But hopefully one day they'll find them interesting. I've learned that sometimes, sometimes in the forest they have to start brush fires to control fires, to burn off the brush. In Africa, it's because the animals stay within a boundary. And if they, don't, if, if they don't start the brush fires, they need to have them. And even though they are free to move around, they don't follow their natural track because they stay within this boundary. So the vegetation has to be burned away. So it's not natural then when you think about that and you think about the boundaries and you think about the animals, and you think about where they are and how we view those animals today and how we look at them, it's not natural for animals to be incarcerated. It's not. It throws off the equilibrium of the jungle. And not only affects the animal that is incarcerated, but the other animals are infected, uh, affected by the loss of that animal's mobility. Because it's not natural to be bound. It's not natural to be a slave. Certain animals can become extinct in a certain area and it affects the other animals in that area. Small animals affect big animals. Big animals affecting small animals. Because God, in his infinite wisdom, set up an ecological system that is so precise that everything that he created has a function. Yeah. Yeah. And
and it functions, and if it functions within the realm in which it was created, it balances everything around it. Everything is blessed when others are free. That same principle in nature is true with us. It's true. When people are bound, regardless of the reason, they cease to function at their fullest potential. <laughs> Having worked with people for years who are bound in their situations, they may be bound by bitterness, bound by anger, bound by complacency. Their whole demeanor changes. Their whole look changes, physically, mentally, and spiritually. And sometimes when those individuals come out of their, them being in bondage, being in jail, and they've been in that jail for some time, they have a problem assimilating back into life, getting back into their normal life, because they have substituted what is normal for, they have substituted what is not normal for what is normal. It is not normal, church, for you to be bound. It is not normal for you to be chained up. It is not normal for you to be enslaved. And even when people are free, those who have been enslaved, enslaved for years don't feel at home in their liberty. Because they've become accustomed to being bound. It's part of who they are. Part of their character. Adapting to their situation. They survived the life of incarceration, but they have not realized how their actions have affected those around them. Maybe a spouse. Maybe children, maybe parents, maybe friends. We need to understand and grasp hold today that our actions affect those around us. If you are joyful, that joy will spread. If you are negative, that negativity will spread. Actually, the negativity will spread a whole lot faster than the joy. Okay? Negati negativity will spread. If you sin, your sin affects those around you. You think you only affect you when you sin, but you don't. You affect those around you. Your bitterness affects those around you. Your anger affects those around you. Your enslavement to those things affects those around you because it's not natural for you to be bound, to be enslaved. It's amazing how we, we can adapt to things that are not natural, how we can adapt to things that are not good. Animals adapt to their environment that they're placed in. And like the animals, we adapt often to the most horrific situations imaginable. And, and if you are not careful, and if you stay in those conditions long enough, you will accept them as normal. And to get to the point in your life where your personality, your character, your disposition, your attitude has all adapted to a situation that is despicable, deplorable, and degrading. And you will come to church or wherever you go to get your inspiration. And you will hear words of motivation that will change you to get out. But when wrong has become normal, it is difficult to liberate yourself. Not so much because of the bondages. The walls around you. But the real wall that incarcerates us is the intellectual wall. Where you begin to imprison yourself mentally. And think that this is how it's supposed to be. Our 
to lock you up for a while. You would resist it with all diligence. But if you stay in a locked condition long enough, you will adapt to your environment and accept it. And the amazing thing is even when liberation comes, you will resist it because bondage has become familiar to you.
are going to be enslaved for 400 years. 400 years is a long time. In 400 years, you adapt to a lot of despicable things. 400 years. 10 generations. Developing a lifestyle that had become so oppressive that for the most part, they had actually forgotten who God was. Forgotten the covenant, the relationship, how to worship, and even who to worship. The enslavement had become so overwhelming, they had become so accepting of their conditions that they lived in, that they had adapted to an environment that was despicable. They knew something was wrong, that where they were wasn't right. They knew it, even though they couldn't remember a day of being free. Isn't it amazing how your spirit knows when something is wrong? You meet somebody, and you don't see anything wrong with them. They look nice, but your spirit says, watch out. All right. <laughs> Be careful. Be careful. And if you learn to listen to your spirit, your spirit will tell you when something's wrong. Amen. Your spirit will tell you that something's wrong with this individual. There's something wrong with this. You can be ready to sign a contract on a deal, but if you listen to your spirit, your lawyer says it's okay, but something down in your spirit says, something's wrong with this deal. I better back out. They knew in their spirit that there was something else. God puts in each one of us that there is something else. There's a desire, there's a hunger to worship Him. He put it inside of each one of us. They not practice their sacraments, nor their ceremonies, nor their rituals, nor their routines. And yet they cried out to God from an oppressed place. What a thing it is to cry to God from an oppressed place and to say, deliver me. Not because I'm holy, because I blew that. Not because I'm serving idol gods, I messed that up too. But any God I carry cannot carry me. So I'm crying to you to deliver me, liberate me, set me free. Now whenever God decides to, live, to deliver us, he will always use someone from among us. Somebody kin to you has to redeem you. Kin. Connected to you. Just a warning note, though. Everybody who is kin to you ain't always kin to you. That's why it is the most difficult thing about accepting a liberator. You have to learn to listen to your spirit and know who is really kin and who really isn't kin, even though they're kin. Does that make sense? Because once something is kin to you, you have a tendency to devalue it. Okay? Bonnie looks at me and says, I knew you when. Is, is not this the carpenter's son? How can anything good come out of Nazareth? I knew you when. I knew you when. And yet God will always use one from among us because in order to, de to liberate people, you have to be touched by the feeling of the infirmity. You have to have sat where they sat. You have to feel their pain. You can't liberate somebody just because you are in the presidential suite of a big office overlooking a river. You have to be somebody who has pushed a broom and come through hell and high water. Then you care for that person on another level. And you can relate. But you can't correct what you don't care about. You understand? Got it so far? Okay, we're moving on. Moses is assigned to, liber to liberate God's people. And that's a difficult thing. 
because they had prayed and asked God to do something, then face to face in doing it, they're difficult to work with. Think about it. Isn't it funny how you can ask God to bring you out of something and then have trouble accepting the out that God brings? Get me out of this house! Get me away from this man! Get me off this job! I went off this job! You know that's why you got laid off? You wanted off the job. God deliver me from this bitter cold. Okay, you remember that this summer. God brings some coolness in this heat. You remember that. Next winter when it snows and it's bitter cold again. You know, all summer long we prayed for God to relieve us from the heat. We got it. We sure wouldn't pray so hard. I don't care how you get me out of this situation. Just get me out of here. Isn't it crazy how we pray for things and then not recognize the answer when it comes? Because it doesn't look like what we think it ought to look like. And it doesn't seem like what we think it ought to seem. They had prayed to God to send a deliverer so they could escape Egypt. But now face to face with deliverance, they are resisting the very thing that they have prayed for. For change does not come easy, church. We want greater things, but we don't want change. Change does not come easy. Change is expensive. Change is difficult. Change is not for whims. Change is not for the impatient. I want to change, and I want it now. Change is not for the impatient. Change is not for the illogical. Change is not just for the frustrated. Change requires strategy, a patient, a relentlessness, a tenacity that says, come hell or high water, I want change. If I, if I have to eat beans out of the tin cup, I want change. If I have to save all my money and wear the same clothes every Sunday, I want change. You see, we want change. But we don't want it like our grandparents wanted it. Our grandparents were willing to suffer to get change in their lives. Change doesn't come easy. You have to work for it. You have to sweat for it. You have to wait on it. I want change, Lord. Even if I have to raise these kids by myself. I want change, Lord. Even if I have to work overtime and get my grandma to watch Little Willie. I want change. Change. Israel wanted change, but then they resisted the change that was coming. They've come down to the hinge of change, the door to the door of opportunity. They've come down to the Red Sea. They've come to the place that will be the pinnacle of change in their lives. For years to come, he will still re be referring to himself. God will still be referring to himself and saying, Am I not the God that delivered you out of the hand of Pharaoh? Am I not the God that delivered you through the Red Sea? Am I not the God that retired your debt? Am I not the God that delivered you from the pits of sin? Am I not the God that brought you out of enslavement? Am I not the God that set you free this morning? Thousands of years later, he will still have this on his resume, and he will say, I have brought you out. There are some in here right now that is not what God did for you last week that has you here, but you have that thing, that one thing that when, whenever all hell was breaking loose in your life and demons were coming against you, everything was falling apart, you stood up, you hiked up your britches, and you said, no, 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 no. You can't make me doubt, devil. I know too much about my God. He's the God who delivered me. Remember that time when you were really in 
in trouble. Not this crazy stuff we pray about now. Lord, give me a parking place. <laughs> Lord, put that dress on sale. I'm talking about when the world was crashing down around you, sickness in your body, cancer in your bones, down to your last dime, and God reached down to where you were and did something for you. That point, that situation, that time becomes the pinnacle of your expression of faith. I don't care how people laugh at you when you, whenever you need to stir up you, your faith, all you have to do is look back at that pinnacle moment and remember that thing, that time, that situation, that thing that he did when I knew the devil was coming in for the kill and God did a thing. There's not a word for it. There's not a statement we can make about it. There's no Greek or Hebrew word that can describe it. He did a thingamajig. He did a whatchamacallit. He did a something or another. He did a nebulous, indescribable thing. That's why I can't tell you how he did it or why he did it. But when I think about it, it was a running in my feet and a clapping in my hands. He did it. He did it. He did a thing. There's some here who know about it. There's some here who have experienced it. And I'm not trying to get the rest of you into that place. Because this is something that you either know about or you don't. It either happened to you or it didn't. You either had a close call or you didn't. You either almost had a nervous breakdown or you didn't. You either almost lost everything or you didn't. You either know it or you don't. Amen. He did a thing. They've now come away from 400 years of slavery, 400 years of depending on Pharaoh to eat and survive, 400 years of surviving his moods, his attitudes, his ego. 400 years of today you have straw, today you don't have straw. It just depends on how I feel this morning as to whether I give you some money or not. You just get to work the best way you can. 400 years of just waking up in the morning not knowing what you're going to deal with. You would be surprised of the people in here who don't know what they're going to face when they get back to the house this afternoon. In Peru, we learned of a village where a church was started. <clears throat> in this church is in the village of miracles. And in this church, we attended there. In this church on a Sunday morning, you could find almost 200 children in that church from the community. The church was mainly made up of women, not men, because the men were drunk in their homes. And the women would wait until the men passed out from being inebriated to sneak out of the house to go to church. And they would have a great time in the presence of the Lord not knowing and sometimes knowing what they would face when they got home. Because many of those women, if the husbands were awake when they got home, got a beating for going to church. Sometimes it's wonderful. Sometimes it is what it is. And you're just dealing with it. 400 years, Israel dealt with it. Now Moses has come to liberate them and to set them free, to emancipate them from the 400 years of enslavement, from 400 years of abuse. And now they've come down to the Red Sea and they've taken all the gold and the silver of the Egyptians. I mean, let's be clear about this. Pharaoh did not come after the children of Israel because he wanted the slaves back. It would have been easier for Pharaoh to go get a fresh batch of slaves. Getting slaves during this time was not a problem. The problem was that, that the Israelites had broken the bank of Egypt. They had borrowed the gold and silver of Egypt. 
Until the Bible says in the Exodus 20 verse 35, they got it all. Pharaoh was chasing them because he wanted his money back. Because there had been a transfer. The wealth for the unjust had been laid up for the just. And there was a switch. You see, hell got nervous at that point. The devil started trembling because there was a switch. Look at your neighbor and say, there's about to be a switch. The head's about to become the tail. The tail's about to become the head. When God gets ready to do something in your life, there's going to be a switch. That's why you have to be careful how you treat other people. Because you don't know who God's going to use to do a switcheroo in your life. Pharaoh was trying to get it back. But once God has set you free, once God has liberated you, once God has opened up a door, you walk out with it all. the children of Israel come down to the Red Sea. Someone in this place has come down to the Red Sea. But things are about to turn around in your life. I mean radical change. Ridiculous change. Mind-boggling change. Change that is so mind-blowing that people just don't understand what you're talking about. When you come to Jesus, when you come to God, and you trust him, and you believe in him, he will give you a testimony that is difficult to tell. Because if you told anybody about the change in your life, they will call for the men in the white jackets. Is there anybody in here who has ever had change in their lives? A lot of people don't want change because they don't want trouble. But listen to me this morning, you can't have change without trouble. You can't have deliverance without trouble. There's no way you can, there's no way for you to become who God showed you in that dream without trouble. Second Corinthians 4, 17 says, our suffering is light and temporary and is producing for us an eternal glory that is greater than anything we can imagine. So now they're in trouble. Change will get you into trouble. People love you until you change. As long as you're a slave, you're okay. But when you say, I'm a son, I'm not a slave, all hell breaks loose. They love you as long as you're serving them and saying, yes, sir, no, sir, I'll be there in a minute, sir. But the moment you pull up your pants and you say, devil, you're a liar, now they act like you think you are so much. And I don't care what you say this morning about me. I don't care what you say this morning about this church. I don't care what you say this morning about the ministry of this church. I want change. <clears throat> down to the Red Sea to realize this won't be they hear something come. Six hundred chosen chariots come down and stop them from change. Six hundred of his most esteemed horses. The very pedigree of Pharaoh has been assembled in a mass to demolish the promise of God for the children of Israel. And the worst part of it, they hear it come. Have you ever heard it come? The very thing you were trying to get away from, you can hear it trying to get you back. There is nothing more frightening as trying to get loosed from something and hear it coming trying to take you back again. I don't know about you, but I know what I'm talking about. You stood up and gave all these big testimonies, and now you hear it coming for you. You shouted at 6 p.m., but at 2 a.m., here come the chariots trying to get you back. The Israelites started murmuring. They started complaining. 
and they started resenting leadership because people get angry when you really preach them out of trouble. Because you preached them out of the bondage they were in, and now they're in a place of uncertainty, unfamiliar with them. You should have left them where they were. Now they're in trouble. And even Moses is uncertain. He's looking up at God and saying, what do I do now? I want you to know something. God does not choose leaders because we know everything. <laughs> God will call you to lead a people and to lead them to a place that you don't know how to get them through yourself. Everyone talks about the leaders you appreciate. But sometimes God will send you a leader you don't like. You don't agree with them. You don't understand. But they have the anointing that you need to get you out of the mess that you're in. They came down to the Red Sea. 600 chariots are approaching them. They start murmuring and complaining. Because one of the sure signs that something is about to happen is when, is when church goes through trouble. When the place of blessing becomes a place of pain. It's a sign that you're close to a breakthrough. If there are any pregnant women or if there are women that have been pregnant, we have kids so there are women that have been pregnant. They will tell you that the harder the pain comes, the closer the baby is. When all hell is breaking loose and you can't tell your friends from your enemies, it's a sign that you're getting close to a breakthrough. The devil wouldn't be fighting you like he's fighting you if you weren't close to a breakthrough. If you didn't have some stuff with you, if you didn't carry some gold with you, if you didn't have some silver with you, some promises down inside of you, you see, God's put some stuff in you that's about to come forth in your life. And the enemy wants to get you back. Israel's come down to the Red Sea. See, my problem is when I read this story and I think about my life and how it applies to my life, Lord, why don't you deliver me in a comfortable way? I mean, since you're God, you can do anything. Why don't you deliver me in a joyous way? Make it convenient. I want to celebrate. Deliver me in the kind of way that doesn't scare me to death. Doesn't make me nervous. There are times when people may look at you and say, I can only imagine the joy you have where you are. I look at you and see how God is using you and how God is blessing you and how God has blessed you, how God is opening the windows of heaven over your life, over your business, over your family, over your job, over everything that goes on in your life. There have been times when folk have said that to me and I think about those comments and I envy the joy that they think I have. Because sometimes deliverance feels better in your imagination than it does in reality. Because in your imagination, you only see the deliverance. You don't see the struggle, the danger, the stress, the pressure that goes along with the way. The way. It is the way God delivers you. He doesn't deliver you, deliver you in an easy, comfortable place. He doesn't give you a bridge across the Red Sea so that you can walk across on the bridge and then unhook it on the other side so that everybody falls into the Red Sea. No, he has to send an east wind to blow back the Red Sea. And you have to step down into something you have never stepped into before. It causes you to walk across. And yes, it's on dry ground. But can you imagine what it must have felt like? Can you imagine? To have your children and your sons and your daughters stepping down and looking at the wall of water on your left and the wall of water on your right. And yes, we're walking on dry ground, but every time you look around, 
you're looking at what could happen any moment. And you start praying, Lord, just hold it up long enough for me to get through this. The enemy is chasing me, and I've got trouble on the left, and I've got trouble on the right. And if you could just hold it up for a little while, I'll get through this. Is there anybody in here who's ever prayed, Lord, just hold it up for a little while? I'm almost out of trouble. I'm almost out of my situation. I'm almost out of my crisis. But if you could just hold it off for me just a little while, just a few more days, I'm so close to a breakthrough. But I need mercy to continue. I need grace to give me an extension. I need you to, I need you to break the curfew and give me just one more hour. Just give me one more paycheck. Just give me one more opportunity. You ever prayed that way? Oh, yes. You're walking through a place of deliverance that is extremely dangerous. They can hear Pharaoh coming behind them. And God has blown back the Red Sea all night long. And they step down into the bed of the river. And the ground is dry, but the walls are wet. The way is made. But at any moment, everything could come crashing down. They can't go back because Pharaoh's behind them. If they step to the left, they drown. If they step to the right, they drown. Church realized that God is going to bring us through a tight place. I don't know who needs this this morning, but God is going to bring you through a tight place. You can't move to the right or the left. It's going to be a narrow way of escape. It's going to be a close call. You're going to barely get through it. You're going to get into it. And you're not going to dance. You're not going to shout. Because isn't it funny how we become more aware of the wet wall than we are of the dry ground? Isn't it crazy how we hear loud, loudest the people who hate us rather than we do all the people who love us? Some may not understand what I'm talking about, but, but, but whenever God delivers you, it's never in a comfortable way so that you can afford to be arrogant because it's always in a dangerous way so that as God brings you out, you're coming out, but you're saying, mercy, Lord, have mercy, Jesus. Every step I take is a step of mercy. Going through, you're saying, if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, I would have been swallowed up with the enemy. Isn't it funny how folk can be jealous of you and they don't know what you are barely that you are barely making it? They're talking about you like a dog, and they don't know that you are down to your last dime. They think you are arrogant. But they don't know that you cried all the way to church. There are some of us here this morning who have barely made it. I've cried my way out. I've crawled my way out. I've pressed my way out. I've barely made it. I didn't speak to you this morning because I didn't see you. I was crawling on my knees just trying to survive. There are some in here today who are making it on a winning and a prayer, and they are barely getting by, and other people are looking at you, and they think you've got it all together, but they don't know that if you had stepped one inch further, the enemy would have destroyed you. If you had slid one inch that way, you'd drown in your circumstances, because it's been a narrow escape. That's why you praise him the way you praise him. Because you know it was a close call. And you know God brought you out. You had hell on the left. You had hell on the right. 
You had hell on your heels. But somehow or another, God brought you out. When you praise the Lord, there are people who don't understand the level of your praise until you see the depths of my pain. Until you understand that I came through hell and high water and I almost didn't make it. It was dangerous. When what I went through last year was dangerous. What I went through two years ago was dangerous. What I'm going through right now is dangerous. But every step I took was ordered by the Lord. For the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Church, this morning, keep on walking. If, you're ta if they're talking about you, keep on walking. If, they if they're after your job, keep on walking. They're threatening you with more child support, but keep on walking. They're after your car, but keep on walking. God says he's going to give you a dangerous deliverance. It's going to be dangerous, but he's going to bring you through. And as you step down into the bottom of the Red Sea on that dry ground, and all hell is on your left and your right and behind you, every step you take, say thank you, Jesus, glory to God, hallelujah, I bless you. Name. I know it's by your grace I made it through the test. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough friends. I don't have enough help. But somehow or another, I'm still here. I escaped. The enemy thought he had me, but I escaped. It was a close call, but I escaped. I almost had a nervous breakdown, but I escaped. I almost, I almost, I almost was killed, but I escaped. If anybody has to praise God this morning, it has to be me, because I escaped. I should have been a statistic. I should have gone crazy, especially in ministry. I should have gone crazy, but I escaped. I should have been locked up right now, but I escaped. I should have died years ago, but I escaped. I've got to praise the Lord when I think about the goodness of Jesus and all that the Lord has done for me. My soul cries out, Hallelujah! Glory to God! For getting me out, for opening this jail cell doors, I escaped. The saints were praying. And the cell doors flew open just like they did for the apostle. I escaped. It was close, but I escaped. God made a way out of no way. I escaped. Some died, but I escaped. Some collapsed, but I escaped. My schoolmates are dead, but I escaped. The kids I played with are in jail, but I escaped. I've got to praise God. I must. Praise. You know what I'm talking about this morning? Oh, yeah. It was close, but I escaped. It was dangerous. But now I'm coming down to the end. Aren't you glad? Oh, yeah. Only ten more pages. <laughs> what I like about this story, they might have they might not have danced when they stepped into the Red Sea. And they might not have danced while they were going through the Red Sea. But the Bible says that when they came out of it, and they looked back and saw where God brought them from, they broke out in a dance and began to praise the Lord. Maybe you're too far in to give God the praise right now. But if there is anybody in here who can look back over your shoulder and see where the Lord has brought you from, you owe it to yourself to give God the praise. Look at this story. I knew they were dancing, but I didn't realize that they were looking back at the dead bodies laying on the seashore. So they were dancing over top the corpses. Think 
crucified. And when they looked at the corpse, they said, somebody died at what God brought me through. Somebody drowned in what God delivered me from. And this morning while you are praising God, I want you to look at all the dead corpses that didn't make it through what you made it through. And I dare you, I double dog dare you, to find yourself a little energy, find yourself a little space, and give God the praise that he deserves for bringing you through. I may not be here, but give God, it may not be here, but you give God praise. Because he brought you through. Not only did he bring you through on dry ground, but he took care of the enemy that was coming after you. Take some time and step over every dead thing that's washed up on the shore. Take some time and step over every stinking thing in your life that now lies dead because the Red Sea drowned. The enemy, church, the enemy, church, the enemy, church, has drowned in the Red Sea. You are never to see them again. They died, but you made it. They drowned, but you made it. You know Jesus this morning? He brought you through. You know Jesus this morning? The enemy is defeated. You know Jesus this morning? The demons are lying dead at your feet. You know Jesus this morning? The Red Sea is parted. The ground is dry. Walk through. But when you get to the other side, you owe God praise. Look back and see how he took care of the enemy. You didn't do it. It wasn't in what you did. It wasn't in your strength. It wasn't in your glory. It wasn't in your might. It wasn't in your doing. It is what the Lord did. Because greater is he that is in, those, in you than those Egyptians chasing you down. Not only did he deliver you through, but you came out with the bank of Egypt. You broke the bank. All the goodness of God. Church, we ought to be praising the Lord every day of our lives. When things get rough, when things get tough, when things are falling apart, remember, he brought you through a dangerous deliverance. Let's stand. <coughs> God saying to you, he said a lot to me. This morning, I don't know what you need is. You do, God does. But this I do know. That you can come to him. Rely on him. Trust him. Even though it looks scary, he will make a way out of me. But you must put your trust in me. Father, this morning, you know the heart of each individual standing here today. Some of us just maybe need to come forward and praise you for a dangerous deliverance. Some of us need to come and say, you know what? I've been, I, I accepted Christ as my Savior years ago, but I'm at that Red Sea. God, deliver me. I'm ready to follow that leader, even though I don't like him. Even though I disagree with him. I'm going to follow him. Because your hand is on my life. And I trust you. Maybe this morning you need to come to an altar and surrender it all.
from all the God and let it go. It's not normal for you to be bound. It's not normal for you to be enslaved. It's not normal for you to be in bondage. It's not normal. It's not normal. It's not normal. Stop accepting the despicable and deplorable places you are in and walk in the goodness and mercy of God.